right, welcome to the podcast of How to Buy a Home In, and we're featuring Old Lake Highlands, and we're here today at District 9 Draft House. Very cool place, German bistro style food. Um, we're gonna throw some pictures of the food up kind of in between our takes. They do some amazing schnitzels. Uh, the, I just had the Reuben, it was phenomenal, really, really good stuff. Um, so in this podcast, uh, the, the idea is that we have our realtor, uh, our real estate professional, someone that's involved in the transaction, and then a boots on the ground person, somebody that helps you through the real estate transaction. So uh, I'll introduce my three guests. We've got Eric Holmes with Compass Real Estate. Hey guys. Chase Pinkston. How are you? And Andrew Siegel, right? And I don't want to mess up his name because there's a relation to Bugsy Siegel there. So I want to make sure. Yeah, way back when. So I want to make sure when this gets posted, I don't get like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on, guys. So. Um, and this first part, we're going to talk about like t in today's market, you know, it's we're shooting this in December of, of 2022. So the market has kind of slowed down or it's changed, if, if you will. So we're talking about, you know, interest rates and how to buy a home in today's market. So I wanted to start out by introducing you, Eric, and just kind of um, you longtime real estate professional. But just tell us a, a little bit about yourself uh, and where you come from. Sure, sure. Um, well, I've been in the business for 24 years. So this is the start of my 24th year. My mother was a realtor growing up. She was licensed in 1977. Uh, and the one thing that you learn once you're in the business is that all of the license numbers are sequential. So she is like a 0228115. I'm 0464497. And now we're up and we're creeping up towards eight. Yeah. Just to give you a perspective of how many agents there are wow. In Texas and, and uh, specifically in Dallas, I think the other day um, they said Metro Tex has 25 or 27,000. I think it's 27,000 agents in the Which DFW Metroplex. Yeah. When I started, it was maybe 10. So yeah. everybody, and this is kind of the ebb and flow of the market when, when things are going fantastic, everybody's like, I want to be a realtor. I want to be in, yeah. And then, uh, you know couple years later, they're like, listen, that was a bad idea. But, uh, you know, longevity is part of the business because at the end of the day, I always tell new agents, listen, your time and your experience are your two biggest assets. You can, anybody can get anybody inside a home, but it's knowing what to do once you're inside the home, what questions to ask, and, you know, just helping the buyer, yeah. uh, you know, make the most important so decision of the life. I got to back up, though, for just a second. So sure. mom's been an agent since 1977. Right. So I imagine growing up as a kid, you were, you know, back then it was, you know, there was a, a thing called newspaper and classifieds ads. It was, it wasn't just like Craigslist and, and doing that kind of stuff. So you, you had people calling your house with a, you know, an actual landline. Oh, yeah. If you don't know what that is, you're yeah. dated. We've maybe dated ourselves here, but did mom train you how to answer the phone? And, and that, that, that was a big struggle as we became teenagers and we had our own teenager i'm gonna do it my way hello and she's like i paid x number for a classified at least say you know diana holmes remax or or whatever and uh you know eventually you get used to it but it was growing up as a uh you know a realtor's kid like we were handing out pumpkins at halloween and putting out you know uh little American flags are in 4th of July. It was all, I mean, it's, it's a lot of real estate is self-promotion and popping the collar and just saying, hey, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me if you're moving. And, you know, it's it's, it's just the nature of the beast. Yeah. So did, did mom have like notepad and paper next to the phone at all times for you to take notes on? And uh, did, did yes. you ever get, I have to ask, but did you ever get grounded because you screwed something up? We didn't get I mean, we were relatively good kids. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was, right. It's relative. It's all relative. Um, it's all relative. But no, we uh, we wouldn't. I mean, we wouldn't write down the name and number. But it was it was. She knew what ads she was running. As long as we got the name and number, she was just okay. Um, because again, they were interrupting cheers or something really important that I was involved <laughs> in at the time. And so it was just one of those things. You just, again, I, I didn't know anything else growing up. And so you just, you know, like anything, you just get used to it when you're growing up in that environment. Awesome. So multi-generational, and I'm a third generation home inspector. So I, I feel you're, I you know, know growing up as a kid, like mm -hmm. I had to, you know, dad was like, it cut it at, you know, 16, 30 seconds. And I'm like counting on the little thing. I'm like, 
That's a half inch. Why don't you just say half inch? He's like, because I want you to know what 1630 seconds is. And you're like, oh. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how I grew up. Yeah, that's why I became like such a detailed freak. Like, fizbo, that I am. when you like run across people, like, <laughs> what's a fizbo? Yeah. Like, that's second nature to me. I mean, like, it's for sale by owner. Like, don't, how don't you know these types of things? Like, this is just, I thought it was it's part second of the nature to me. Yeah. yeah. I thought it was a clown. Yeah. No. Fizbo. No, 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 yeah. No, no, no. He was a West Coast clown, right? Fizbo. Something like that. <laughs> so, let's kind of, uh, stay on track here i know um so let's just talk about the process like how do you have uh, a client that wants to buy a home uh, they find you what does that process look like so they contact you and they say hey a friend of mine gave me your number and said you know call eric he's he's my agent and then what do you do like how do you what are the, what steps do you take I mean, it's it's. I always say it's not rocket science, but again, a lot of what I do is is, is everything is experience based. Okay, so when when I get a referral, we just have a, an open conversation about you know um, expectations, what they want their price point to be on a monthly basis, and we talk about all right, well, you're going to get some tax benefits and all of this kind of stuff. Have you talked to a lender? Um, and if they haven't, I, again. Um, you know, Chase, Chase's wife and I went to, we went to the rival high schools back in the day. I've known Chase for 20 plus years. And so I can all, I can rattle off. We'll call Chase 214-507-8016. Yeah. And that's what I tell these other lenders that would love to work with me. I'm like, listen, this is about just, I'm a repetition <laughs> guy. I got to be able to rattle off a phone number if, and when that conversation happens. And so I do a lot of work with Chase. Um, and once we have that expectation i want to get them in front of him because we're coming we're coming out of a hyper competitive market where yeah. it was literally like i would explain it to him like we have to build a resume uh, of why this seller would choose you and so if you don't have a proof qualification from a local lender not a big bank but a local person a brick and mortar here in town said so you're just you're swimming upstream let me ask you just break one question and i don't want to make this longer than it needs to be but what do you do when somebody has one of those big box banks with a prequal like a like a Bank of America or a Chase Bank or something like that. Because I know that some agents, when they when they get a listing, they're like they're pre-qualified by Bank of America. They'll turn down a deal just because it's 100%. not a local guy. So how do you tell your people that? Like, just hey, I know you've got that, but should I just turn them? Go ahead and turn them over to Chase anyway. So what I will uh, again, it it is about getting across the finish line and in a hyper competitive market where you know as of January first of this year, the the statistic was houses were appreciating three hundred dollars a day. Yeah. And so if you gave that if you got a home under contract and you weren't able to perform with a closing time, there's a greater than zero chance that the seller would just say, you know what, the house has appreciated ten thousand dollars since we started this process. I'm kicking you out. I've got a buyer waiting in the back, uh, you know, in my back pocket that's, that'll pay me whatever. And go. They've got somebody local. Yeah. At the end of the day, like the big banks, nothing against big banks. I always say if it's apples to apples, you know, use use somebody brick and mortar, Chase or whoever, yeah. because the, the listing agent wants somebody to, they want to be able to knock on the door, pick up the phone and track that person down. Yeah. If, if you're working with a big bank, unfortunately, that person who's the it's rainmaker, who, yeah. who your point of contact they might is, be in another state. once you're through that initial contact, they shuffle you into the next person yeah. and then the next person and then the next person. And yeah. if I call that lender and say, hey, where are we in this process? They're going to go, I don't know. I don't know. So now, I'm just kind of breaking away for just a second. So, I mean, what how, what's the ratio of that? How many of these, how many people do you get from a big box lender? If we can go head to head to them? No, no, no. I'm saying, like, how many people come to you that have already pre-qualified with a big box lender and, and we're trying to make get them through Converted. you? Yeah. Con you're trying to convert them. Is maybe a, maybe twenty percent. They, okay. they get online because they've got these big fancy calculators, so they can kind of play with. And then, yeah. And then to get to where they want to with the calculator, they've got to put in a little bit too more, you know, a little bit more and more information. Next thing you know, they might not have even intended to make an application, and they just slowly pull themselves into getting, it. Yeah, they get notifications and emails and alerts, and everybody calling them. I yeah. mean, that's what I always say. Again, <laughs> I, if you're not going to work with my sphere of influence, if you're working outside of that sphere. I no longer have influence on the outcome. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, they don't know me from Adam. Yeah. Like, Chase wants me to refer him more people. So he's got a vested interest in trying to make sure the timelines are adhered yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. But if you're at a big bank, they do not 
care. You yeah. are a number. You are not a person. You're not getting get a phone call on your your closing anniversary. All of these types of things that you yeah. would hope you would expect. Uh, again, concerning the amount of money that you're about to spend. That that, that so, so you touched on something that I want to make sure our viewers know that is really important. So it, it's it's extremely important that you get a good real estate agent that is known in the area that has done lots of transactions because when you're writing that offer. If the person on the other side of the table sees that name, they're like, I've done deals with that person before. You, your name, your deal, your offer might get kind of shuffled to the top, right? 100%. Like, yeah. Again, so, especially, like, again, I, I grew up in North Dallas, which is, you know, all slab foundations and whatnot. But here in East Dallas, it's more pier and beam. And it's just a different... It's a different, as you know, it's a different yep. inspection totally and expectations different inspection. Are, are completely different. Yep. And so what you have is you'll have uh, these agents because the price points here in East Dallas can be higher than they would be in other areas of yep. North Dallas, Plano, et cetera. So, so let me, let me get back to sort yep. of, um, you've got client, you've got, they've got their sort of wish list or dream list, uh, and maybe they've already know what neighborhood or they want to go to, um, just on average, what's the, the most houses that you've ever shown to a person? I mean that's that's a number that uh, will will make make a job. And he doesn't want to do that every time. I bet. Right, right, right. I mean the the, <laughs> the average person is looking anywhere from ten to twenty homes. Like okay. the most I've shown um, was close to or to one person was, uh, and this is over a one year period of time, was. 130 to 150 homes like wow. it, was, it was a process i mean <laughs> all of them yeah um so yeah but now i'm assuming that was probably a little earlier on in your career or it was a really close friend or something like that where right. you were just being kind and nice and that kind of stuff but you know most of the time i think agents have that kind of window narrowed down to like okay we give me your wish list of everything that you want here's everything that you're looking for and you know let's go from there but let, let's just uh before we kind of move it over to chase's part Let's say you've shown into the, you know today's market. You've shown a whole bunch of houses, and, and they're just that's nothing's clicking, right? Right. Do you come back and say, okay, you gave me that your wish list, like you want the bathroom, you want the pool, or you want the backyard, um, but then you're showing houses, and they say, well, I want a storage shed, but they never told you that. How, right. how do you how do you kind of so, re readjust that list with them without hurting feelings and making sure that everybody gets what they want? Uh, part of the, the part of the process or part of the business is managing expectations. So if you were trying to say you wanted to buy an old Lake Highlands and you had a sp specific price point, mm -hmm. well, I, what I will do um, is I will go back and, and say, all right, historically, we're going to have 16 to 18 properties that will come up over any given year. And here's the information. Here it was from 2020, 2019, 2018. And so that we have an, a reasonable expectation of when these homes are going to come on the market, how many that are going to be coming on the market, and how quickly that they're going to sell. Yeah. And so it's just going, okay, well... We've seen everything that's on the market in Old Lake Highlands, but that's okay because we we're, we were only ten properties in this price point, and we have another ten that will be coming on in the market. Yeah. We just have to be poised to strike, and I'm going to use my networking skills um, to see if anybody has any hip pockets or yeah. pocket listings, whatever you want to call them, right. off market properties um, that that we can hopefully get our foot in the door before it even hits the market. I mean, the so just kind of I want to wrap up just sort of this yeah. little segment, but so money is important. Money is important. For Timing sure. is important. Like you want to know when are, when are you trying to get out of your place or when do you have to be in a place? And so there, that creates a different sort of sense of urgency. I bet. Cause if they don't have to move, they can take their time and they can kind of shop around. But if they've got a relocation and they're moving from, cause a lot of our viewers are going to be from across the country. So it's like, well, they got to have this right now. And so your approach to that, to that is a little bit different. Right. And that's part of the, uh, the initial conversation is like, all right, what is your timing? All right. Because a, a typical transaction is call it 30 to 45 days. Yep. Again, in the hypermarket that we just came out of that was could even be 10 days to 30 days but it was quick yeah um you know standard is anywhere from 30 to 60 days okay. and because the lender has to do their part yeah um the the title company needs yep. to do their part title company's gonna do all their fun stuff there are some timelines that are in place with the option period and the financing contingencies that basically say hey, we don't want to order the appraisal until until we're through the through with the option because you're just once that appraisal is ordered that money's spent it's done and, and yep. you're on the you're on the hook for it regardless okay all right so real estate process eric holmes compass real estate we're yep. going to be right back I'm Clayton Bailey, your host of How to Buy a Home In. Uh, 
our company's uh, Green Scene Home Inspections third generation inspector. So just want to make sure that you all know who we are and what we're talking about. So we're talking about how to buy a home in Old Lake Highlands. So we're going to come back to Eric here at the end of the segment, and we're going to really focus on Old Lake Highlands and sort of some of the, the schools and the parks and the, and the price points and the square footage and the... I got to talk about the home inspection problems because that's, you know, that's, that's just what it is. So we'll be right back. Uh, check out these awesome pictures of the food here at District 9. It's amazing. So German style, bratwurst, schnitzels, uh, really good stuff. So we'll be right back. We're back, and now we're going to talk about lending with Chase Pinkson, Integrity Mortgage. So let's talk about interest rates. Let's talk about how to qualify somebody. Let's talk about sort of getting financially naked in front of you. Like, that's such a weird thing to say, but you kind of have to see through that. So first off, tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been in the business. All right. Uh, Clayton, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, I will be celebrating my 20th year in the business in a few months. Um, I've been in DFW real estate um, my whole career. Uh, I've absolutely loved it. It's been a great, great ride. But for most of it, interest rates have been very, very, very low. So for a lot of us, unless they've been in the business for 30 or 40 years, we've never seen what we've seen for the last few months. It does seem to be subsiding. It looks like inflation is getting better. Rates are calming down a little bit, and hopefully this trend is going to continue. Um, may not go back to the twos ever again, <laughs> but I hope we, we don't come want that close epidemic and try. again yeah. either. No. <laughs> we don't want that epidemic no. again. Uh, but you're a local boy. You graduated from SMU. Is that right? Married a girl from SMU. Married a girl from SMU. Okay. Born in Lufkin. Grew up in Arkansas. Got back as quick as I could. Okay. Awesome. So what kind of credit score do people need to qualify to buy a house? I know that's always the big question for people. Yeah, and we don't, we don't have set rule. Now, to, to get approved and get closed, you're going to need a little bit higher score. I mean, ideally, uh, we need somebody with a 620, 640 is even better. Okay, um, 620, 640. If somebody comes to me and they don't have that, we'll work with them. I mean, some of my clients, I'm working with somebody right now that they couldn't believe how old the file had, how long the file had been in the system, but three years of, of doing what we asked them to do. Yeah. And she's under contract and she's going to close next month. So when you say if the, something was on the system, so like, like a bad ding on the credit score kind of thing, is that what you're talking like about? Just not understanding how credit had affected her and how her decisions and just little things were, were creating this track record over time right. that made, to, got to the point where nobody wanted to, you know, seller a car, oh, credit okay, card. And so we've been slowly tying off loose ends and changing our behavior. And like I said, it's been a three or four year process, but now she's, you know, a 660 and she's off to the races. Nice. Yeah. So at what point do you send somebody to a credit repair or a credit solutions type of it company? It really depends on the extent of the damage. Okay. If there's massive liabilities that there's just no way that they're ever they're ever going to get dealt with any other way. That kind of person may need credit repair. A lot of times the, we're helping people just because they've got three credit cards, but all their debt's on one. Right. And they need to, they need to just manage what they have mm -hmm. a little bit better, pay their bills on time. It, it's, it's little things that'll get their scores up. So uh, the next question I have is, how much money down do you need to buy a house today? As little as 3%. As little uh, as 3%. I, I always say, if you want to put zero down, we've got a wonderful program. 3%. We've got a wonderful program <laughs> that involves a small commitment to the U.S. government in to serve our armed forces for three, four, five years. And you okay. can come back and get a VA loan and okay. put zero down. Love that. I and mean, we love supporting our troops. Uh, and we love the fact that they can come back and do that. Mm -hmm. So 3% down um, and, and getting financially naked. We kind of talked about that a little bit. But, you, you know, when people come in and they've probably gone online and done their credit score, but you pull like a deep credit score and you re you're really going to see everything it, that's on there and everything that pops up and then you know having that conversation a professional conversation with what what is this right here and you probably already know what some of that stuff is but how, how do you approach that and how do you see that when it pops up you know we're there at the end of the day we're their advocate we're, we're their tour guide we're trying to get them to where they're trying to go telling me everything mm-hmm and us finding a solution is better than trying to hide stuff because 
it's amazing, you know, stuff that's not on a credit report may be on a fraud report. So oh. this stuff comes up. So it's best we get it out in the open. We talk about it. We're so virtual now. The good thing is when you're getting financially naked, you're probably at home in the safety of your living room. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And I'm on the other side of town. Right. Uh, but we try to be as discreet as possible. Okay. So um, what is PMI? What Everybody talks about that. And if you're kind of a first-time home buyer, if you're new to the game, like you got to have PMI. What's PMI? It's not as it's not as scary as people think. It's private mortgage insurance. It basically says, if I make you a loan, and something bad happens, okay, and the house goes heaven forbid it goes into foreclosure, and I don't get all of my money back, it's insuring me against loss. Okay. It's why there's people lining up to buy these mortgages because there is, you're going to get a rate of return. There's zero chance of loss. Right. And on loans without very much down, that mortgage insurance protects whoever is going to to hold and service that loan from so, any chance of loss. So that's something that probably wasn't in place in 08 and 09 as much? You or know, what did was there PMI like enforced in that era as well? The PMI was there. The problem is, is values went down. Okay. And when values went down, now all of a sudden that policy that was designed to, you know, to help me recoup two or $3,000 became 20000 became 30000 became 40000 Yeah, it's hard. Uh, I mean, that's one of those things about being inside the loop yeah in Dallas closer to the central business district values held I mean yeah. you saw maybe like a half percent to one percent but it's where we because Dallas a little harder to sell the, the Metroplex oh. you're yeah. there's always the next farm down the road where yeah. developers that's where we had issues where people went in with very little down and then next thing you know they're upside down yeah and that same builder is literally down the streets on the same product at the same price that's where people got crushed yeah. So, um, advice to give uh, home buyers that are that are looking to buy a house here in Old Lake Highlands and in Dallas, or just coming to Texas specifically, what when's the best time to get involved, and what's sort of the best way to tee them up to make sure they have the greatest success? I mean, we do long range planning, two, three, four years out for kids that are just coming out of college that that need a plan. How much do I need to save? But, you know. So you get involved with kids like right out of college just to say, what's your plan? Okay, that's Absolutely. awesome. But, and some people will jumpstart the process. They'll get a gift from a family member. Um, there's, you know, we have uh, for larger properties, There's you can do a, a combination loan, a first and second lien, and buy for somebody that, you know, has all of a sudden, you know, advanced in their career to where they're now making a lot of money, but they don't have a lot of money saved. Right. Uh, there's products that will get them to almost – Anything they can dream of. Okay. So um, what's the worst thing that you could do during the real estate process, like the tran in the transaction? What's the worst thing that a buyer could do? You know, I always tell people, hold still. Hold still. <laughs> Protect Very your social still. security number. Don't give it out to anybody. Don't run out and start buying stuff. There's going to be plenty of time to do that. Uh, but we're trying to take a snapshot and it's really hard to do while you're moving around. Yeah. So, so just to kind of reiterate on that just a little bit, and then we're, we're going to kind of wrap your section up here. But so when people have that, um, you're pulling credit score at the beginning to pre-qualify, but then Correct. you still have to pull it at the end before closing, right? We don't re-pull unless that person's been in our system for a while and it needs to be refreshed. Okay. But we do what is called a soft pull that a lot of people don't know about, and that's what will get people in trouble. We're just kind of doubling back to make sure... You didn't Somebody go didn't out and do something crazy. Or... And I've had it happen before where I had to call a client and go, hey, can you tell me what this is? Did you buy another house? And she's like, no, that's a Porsche. <laughs> she was fine. And the agent goes, oh. oh yeah. Right. It was Have just you a, had that happen to you? It was a little bit of a surprise. Where somebody uh, bought a car, like, right at the end? No, we are, Clayton and I were on a transaction, 06, 07, something like that, and it was a teacher in their contract. And basically, we were up against the financing contingency, and he hadn't signed his new contract. And oh. so I'm calling him, yeah. like, dude, we need to terminate. You're going to lose your earnest money. But I guess he was too embarrassed oh, uh, for whatever anything. reason. And, you know, we just kind of blew by the contingency couldn't close, and so they forfeited their earnest money. So, I mean, oh, again, we're, bummer. he and I are trying to make sure we, uh, you're we're, protected. Yeah, we're the we're the curbs on the road of this purchase. We want to keep this car rolling. Yeah, that's a good point, Eric. Stay employed. That's super <laughs> that's helpful. Like, yes. If you know you're doing it, make sure you're in there. So, last few questions here, Chase. Uh, what's your favorite thing about being in the mortgage business? Um, like solving problems, and I like people. 
and that's pretty much all I do all day long is deal with You're people. You're in the right business. And solving solve problems. problems and helping people. You got awesome. It. So that's our company motto is do the right thing, always tell the truth, and help others. And if you, you, just, you kind of have that, be that giver and helper and, and, and be in there. And um, why do you work for Integrity Mortgage? So there's a lot of different mortgage lenders out there, but why Integrity? Yeah, we're going on 14 years. They think a lot like I do. Okay. Work hard, do the right thing, take care of your people. And at the end of the day, everything usually works out. And then uh, last couple questions here. What's the craziest story that you could tell me on air that's PG rated? PG is probably getting a call from an appraiser back when we were allowed to talk to appraisers. He's just like, we've got a hoarder. <laughs> you got to get over here. Call and, me. and it was in, a, it was in <laughs> the right. M streets. And we went in and this house probably had half of its cubic square footage inside the house gone because she was buying those ream paper boxes, getting the ream paper boxes from the behind the old yeah. FedEx Kinkos yeah. and just filling them with newspaper clippings. So they were like Legos. They were very neat, but the entire house oh, wow. was filled with boxes. And, and who teed you off to that? The appraiser? He was just like, you got to come see this. <laughs> <laughs> so does he, because can he flag that or is that, is that a thing? There's nothing that, wrong with it. Okay. I mean, All right. It's, uh, just, it I've, is, seen a, I've seen an appraiser flag because of, you know, a foundation or a whatever. And they kind of say, no. and then, the, and then it bounces it back from underwriting and the lender where they're like, hold on, we need to make sure this is a good. A seller like that is going to give Eric more problems because he's going to have to go over there and making sure they're getting their stuff out on yeah. the schedule. And, and we, this is why we need Andrew in the That's world right. because we've got to have that. Um, all right, Chase, right how that. do we get in contact with you? Oh, you can pop that up on the bottom of the screen, but you can always call me at 214-507-8016. You can call Eric. Eric knows my number. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And you can all find right. me online. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on. I appreciate it. Good things. And you stick around because we're going to keep on going. Um, next, we're going to talk to the most interesting junk guy in the city. Like the stories that you're going to tell are, are just amazing. So uh, more pictures from District 9 Draft House Food, and we'll be right back. <laughs> And we're back with probably one of the most interesting, and no offense to you guys, but he, this guy, he sees some really interesting stuff. And so, uh, again, the premise of this show is to have the real estate uh, professional, the realtor, uh, a, a real estate you know, transaction person, somebody that's involved in there, and then a boots on the ground person, somebody that's involved in like helping a buyer or helping people move and sell. So Andrew Siegel, junk luggers of greater Dallas. And, you know, when we talked before, I was really intrigued by the, the way that you guys work and the fact, you know, we're a green sustainable company. Yeah. And one of the things you do, you just don't like load up trucks and take it all to the landfill. So you guys actually repurpose some of this stuff and, yeah. and donate it. So it has a second life, right? Yeah. Our goal is to donate as much as possible. Just this week, we dropped off 70 roughly cell phones to Genesis Women's Shelter. Wow. Which they'll now, and they were all working functional phones, brand new in the box. So they what? can use those for the people that they're helping. That came from one client who was a in the cell phone sales business. So these oh. were samples okay. that he had boxes and boxes full. So we just, you know, put, nice. them, put them to good use. Yeah. So um, tell us, uh, before we get into all that, because yeah. I'm, I'm just, in, I could talk to you forever and ever. It's but a fun job. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and because you're local native, yep. you, you, and you did graduate from SMU. I'm yes. sorry I confused that, Chase. I got yep. that backwards. So you did graduate from yeah. SMU. I moved down to Dallas in uh, 1998 to go to graduate school at SMU, the Cox School of Business. Spent two years there, loved it. Um, one of the best decisions I've ever made. And then decided to kind of stick around. Uh, married a local girl. Uh, she went to Pierce High School, so I'm, yep. you know, not going anywhere. Um, we were living down in the M Streets. I've always lived on the east side of Dallas. I lived just north of Deep Ellum for a while. Now, then I lived in the M Streets, uh, and then we moved up to Lake Highlands. And I just kind of it reminds me of the hills of Connecticut, like yeah. where I grew up. I was up. just about so, to yeah. ask you, like, where you're originally from. Yeah. So, bringing it back, and so yeah. everybody that lives here, I feel like. I got here as quick as I could. Like, mm -hmm. I, this is my place. These yep. are my people. This is what it is. But no one really holds it against. I'm from Kansas, so mm -hmm. I don't feel like anybody holds it against you if you're not native. But it just seems like We're just you not know, telling if, if you, you in front if of you your married face. that it's native girl, it's like, oh, he's they're native. It's so it's like your stock goes up. So, yeah. but you know, it's all good. You got right. here as quick as you could. Yeah. So. Tell us about junk luggers and why did you choose this industry? Sure. So, um, well, I've spent 20 years in Dallas uh, working primarily in the IT industry, a little bit of time in marketing, but bounced around through a whole variety of companies and COVID kind of brought that career path to an end. And my wife and I were sitting there thinking, okay, what's the next chapter? 
And she said, well, you've been looking at franchising just kind of fun for a couple of years now. Why don't you find one and actually jump in? And I stumbled upon the Junk Luggers, which is a franchise out of Connecticut. Uh, it's been around for about 15 years. And it really focuses on keeping things out of the landfill. Uh, we try to donate as much as we can, recycle what we can't donate, and then if we can't donate or recycle, then we do end up bringing it to the landfill or finding another option. Um, the, the key for me was that my grandmother downsized, and she lived in Houston, and I remembered what a nightmare it was for my mother to deal with six closets full of clothing that she had accumulated over the years, yeah. and filling up a Camry and taking it to donation centers every day. So we use a much bigger truck. It makes it a lot easier. Um, we do charge for the service. Okay. But yeah. it's, uh, I like to consider ourselves Tylenol for the realtors yeah. because we take care of those headaches. You know, the pile of bricks that the husband had by the side of the house for a project that he was never going to complete. Uh, the, all the pieces of wood scrap in the garage. The kids' yeah. stuff that's been upstairs in their room for 30 years. So like the house that Chase had, you know. Yep. There's pile of boxes or whatever, that would and, be if, easy. and and yeah. if Holmes was involved, I don't know if Holmes was involved in that transaction, but Holmes is probably calling you yep. to say, "Hey, closing date is at this time," mm -hmm. and he's probably shooting a little warning shot yeah. over. And I'm assuming, do you you guys probably have a clause in your contracts that says you got to have all your stuff out, right? Like no, there's a special. No, actually, there's nothing that states that everything has to be removed. Now oh. it can be written into the special provisions paragraph That's what I was thinking of about. the contract. Yeah. But uh, but no, you're, I've you're been wise involved. enough to do that, right? I've been on the the listing side where that hasn't happened, and it's kind of you don't want to be a bad steward. But yeah, my responsibility if I'm on the listing side is to the seller. I don't tell the list the buyer's agent, hey, yeah. they're not moving out, or they've got this so much stuff. It's, right, it's really up to the, the buyer's agent's got to do their job. Right, yeah. So for you, like, what kind of notice do you need? The more, the better. Like, let's just I mean, say that he's got that scenario, and the and the closing is. Yeah. At this time, and then, you know, you go to do your final walkthrough of the house, and they still notice that it's full of stuff, and he calls you and says, Andrew, I need you. The worst we've ever done was I got a call at 9 a.m. We got to the house at 11 a.m. The closing was at 1 p.m. I don't like those because we never know how much volume there's going to be when we get there until right. we get to the house. Even with photos, it can be a little deceiving. So you want to know and get as much time as possible. So we just finished working with a client this week who isn't, he's closing in February. Okay. Um, but, he, or he's closing in January, but they've got a lease back until February. So he hired us to come in and we spent a week emptying out seven truckloads from his home. Wow. Uh, he lived there for 50 years. He had a whole bunch of stuff piled up in the garage and a shed full of stuff uh, in the backyard. And we're going to, you know, either donate or recycling most of it. Yeah. Um, and now that's, um, you said seven truckloads. Yeah. So, and you guys charge by the truckload, but then you can right. also charge by like half a truck or. Yeah, it, an, it starts or, at an eighth of a truck, which okay. is two cubic yards, about the size of a standard house fridge. Yeah. Uh, all the way up to a full truck, which is 16 cubic yards. And that's, they say enough for a one bedroom apartment, but Texas apartments are a lot bigger than the Northeast. So, um, it, you know, we co come out, we always give a no obligation, no cost estimate. Uh, and if it's a bigger job, I'm happy to come ahead of time to do the estimate as well. And what makes you different than other junk callers? The, the key is the uh, the green. Okay. Really. I mean, a lot of people have a little, you know, recycling logo on the back of their truck, but we really take a lot of pride in that. Yeah. Uh, the people at St. Vincent's know me by, uh, St. Vincent de Paul know me by name. Like I said, we work with Genesis, we work with uh, Jewish Family Services, Network of Community Ministries, a number of uh, donation centers that they know when we get there, we've already gone through and only bring them the stuff that they want. Yeah. Um, but they've got to be big enough to be able to handle a full truckload of stuff when we show up. Yeah. So that's uh, that's really the, the catch there. Awesome. So, yeah, we just did a, a community event. It was actually Holmes was there for my birthday at uh, Center of Hope. I don't know if you ever dealt with them, but I'll turn you on yep, to them as do. well. It's a yeah. women and children's shelter, and they're, they're trying to get them back up on their feet, and that's they have great. their own little dorms, and they, they live off of donations. So that's I'll make sure wonderful. that you get pointed yeah. out to them. Um, so I know you, you brought some things. Oh, I sure. wanted you to be able to share some of this stuff because I think it's interesting, like the, the things that you run across when you're yeah, these. This is one of my looking. favorites just because my father went to medical school in the 60s. And so his calculator was a slide roll. Um, and so we get these all the time, especially, yeah, living, sure, in, yeah, especially living in Dallas. Um, you know, a lot of engineers, a lot of former engineers, uh, TI people, et cetera. 
and you know the thought of trying to make it through algebra or trigonometry with one of these <laughs> just gives me a headache thinking about it. Yeah. And this one's especially cool because it came with the instruction book. Wow. So, um, no, batteries. I, I yeah, no batteries. I just no batteries. You are yeah. batteries. Yeah. I just threw up in my mouth just looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I remember those. <laughs> like this. abacus style, like uh -huh. this little guy. Okay, what is this? So this is a 600 megabyte hard drive. Oh wow! So oh, wow. it weighs. A good 10 plus good pounds. Good night. A lot. Holy um, cow. Yeah. And you compare that to a cell phone, yeah. which yeah. has uh, a couple thousand times the memory of it. Yeah, absolutely. Just, this is from, I, I believe, the 80s, late 80s uh, time period. That, but it was yeah. expensive in its day. Oh, it was, uh, it was high end. I mean, the, and the server, we, the server we pulled it from was about the size of this table and six feet tall. Wow. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. We pulled this from a house in Carrollton. You can't probably read it, but it's the National Baby Parade from 1930 in <laughs> Asbury Park, New Jersey. I'll hold it up so the camera, yeah. a little bit closer to the camera so you can see it. So Yes. Wow. So when you get this stuff, you know, do you ever, like the owner says, you know, get rid of all of it, yeah. I don't care, and then you're like, okay, yeah. here's the deal. But has there any been any instances where you find something and you're like, you call them back and say, are you sure you want to get rid of this? Like, I found this yeah. thing, and I don't think you meant to throw this away. We have in a number of cases. We have uh, we had one where there was a crate in the garage, and we looked, kind of peeked into it. It's a bunch of stained glass windows. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I called the customer, and I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah, they're all broken, and we never got around to repairing them. So we got them to someone, and they repaired them and you know got them taken care of. I have uh, returned a wedding photo. A gentleman gave us the keys to his house. I mean, we do small jobs where it's just a couple things, but we've also done big ones where they've literally handed us the keys to the house and said, right. we've taken everything we want, just empty the rest of it out of here. Right. And I called the gentleman back and I said, I found your sister's high school diploma from Highland Park High School in the 1940s and her wedding photo that was taken at the Neiman Marcus studio. Wow. Do you want these back? And he was like, thank you. He was so thrilled yeah, to get sure. them because he didn't want to go through all the paperwork, like newspaper clippings and yeah. recipes and all that. But he, you know, these little things kind of percolated to the top of the pile. Yeah, um, I mean, I know that sort of older boomer generation. They kind of, you know, they hide things in yeah. places, and so then kids inherit it, and they're like, right. "Hey, Dad left me this sofa." Right. But then they start to look in the sofa, mm -hmm. and there's like thousands of dollars stuff. Yeah, we in haven't the sofa. had that yet. That's <laughs> not, have, not had that one happen no, yet. There's a poster yet. of the Iceman George Gervin from the San Antonio Spurs circa 1980 mm -hmm. that's sitting in my mother's attic right now. I know yeah. it. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Because it's, it's my there. poster. And yeah. Yeah. Like, it's there. Yeah. So tell me, what, what's your wildest story uh, that you could tell about being a junk lugger? So it's really, I mean, the thing I love about it is meeting the interesting people. It's like you said, it's a people business. You know, when you're, whenever you're working the real estate business, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I agree with you about going with a local provider is that you want to have that face-to-face -face interaction with whoever the people yeah. you're working with are. And, uh, you know, I met a gentleman who uh, provided all the props for Walker, Texas Ranger. He owned a prop oh, company. Wow. Right I uh, met a woman who was the first independent o female OBGYN in the city of Dallas. Uh -huh. Um, I've just made, and we do a lot of work with seniors. We take a very caring approach to it. We're not just throwing their stuff into bags and throwing yeah. it on the truck. They see that we're taking pride in it and we're going, they know that we're going to donate it. And that makes them a lot more comfortable letting go of the things. Yeah. So when, I think that's when, a big yeah, piece of you it. just brought up a, like a point, like when you and I talked earlier, um, you would, you know, people are like, I want this furniture out of here. And, and you go in and, and you'll wrap it up with the blanket mm -hmm. and they're like, no, 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 I'm, I'm throwing that away. I don't want it. And you're like, no, 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 I, I don't want to damage your walls. Right. Like, I don't want to hurt your house. And yep. then it's just that pride in that that, yeah. that you take in the job. Like said, and it's a people business. Yeah, and you got to take care of people. It's people. And it's also, I mean, a financial because we're you know getting that house emptied so right. that Eric can have a smooth transaction. Or, I mean, I mean, you know much better than I do, but that house, if you removed all those boxes, is going to sell for more than a 100%. house that's filled with boxes and other, I mean, and a boxes sound like a wonderful, we've done some, you've asked for worst case, we've done with houses that were, you know, one step from being on the television show Hoarders. Um, you know, it's, I've you know, it some, gets pretty we've bad. All, we've all been there, oh, yeah. done that, yeah. seen, seen some crazy things. Yeah. All right, Andrew, well, thank you for sharing your oh, stories. Sure. I think you're an amazing company. Thank you for being sustainable. Yeah. How do people get to hold of you? Uh, easiest is uh, go to our website, uh, junkluggers.com. Junk all right, um, we'll flesh that in the bottom yeah. of the screen or, here. Or uh, 1-800-LUG-JUNK. LUG-JUNK. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for being with us. I appreciate it. Stick around. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about Old Lake Highlands. We're going to talk about schools. We're going to talk about parks. We're going to talk about events. So we'll be right back. All right, we're back. Now we're going to dive into Old Lake Highlands proper, kind of spread out and expand to East Dallas. Like all these guys live in the area, so they all are going to kind of chime in with some of their stories about uh, East Dallas. But sp specifically, let's talk about Old Lake Highlands. So um, this is your stomping grounds. We're, we're like, what, feet from your house, I think, probably. Yeah, we're about... Um, eh probably a three wood away from where I live. I mean, it's <laughs> about 250 yards. I still drive down here. Yeah. I mean, just because I can be lazy sometimes. But, I mean, uh, we've been here, my wife and I have been here since 2007. We had our daughter in 2008. This is home. I yeah. mean, I grew up in Farmer's Branch, which is a first-rung suburb. Um, but we moved to East Dallas, and, I mean, this I is wouldn't it. move anyplace else. So what are the borders like what would you and i'm not saying you have to say sure. streets but like you know talk about yeah i you know east it, dallas it, what are the na neighboring surrounding neighborhoods and it, and sort of bordering? well I, I when i describe east dallas i basically use uh white rock lake as and i just say it's basically a clock all right the, if you go to nine o'clock that is lakewood m streets 12 o'clock is lake highlands three o'clock that's old lake highlands and eastwood and whatnot and then you get to six o'clock and that's when you're talking about forest hills little forest hills emerald isle okay. things, things of that nature yeah but old lake highlands like i said we're we're on the three o'clock side the east side of the lake you get a little bit of a price break from from just you know an extra five minute commute and that's what made it attractive to us right um my wife is uh, works at a private school, so we weren't necessarily concerned about public schools. But Old Lake Highlands feeds to Hexter Elementary, which is, you know, for really the, good school. It's a blue ribbon school. People yep. are constantly trying to figure out, all right, how how do we, you know, because that's where everybody. How do I get into that neighborhood? How exactly. do I get into that school? Exactly. And so, I mean, again, we're kind of the the uh, cheaper version of. Lakewood, but still being able to access the lake. I can get to the lake by walking four blocks, basically. Okay. So for our viewers out there that, that don't know anything about East Dallas, let's talk about sort of the high-end price points of East Dallas and sort of the more budget-friendly price points of East Dallas, like um, neighborhood-specific. Sure, sure, sure. Old Lake Highlands, um, like I said, it's, it's roughly around $350 a square foot right okay. now. When I bought, it is $150. Um, okay. I mean, in Dallas in general, again, my mother's been in the business for... 77. Yes, since 77, <laughs> since I was five years old, to, to give you a perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, houses are going to uh, double in price every 15 years. Yeah. Um, and that's basically what my wife and I have experienced since we've been here in our previous house in East Dallas, same thing. Um, but it is a... Um, uh, on the higher end, we do have some teardowns in the neighborhood. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing one five to two now, which, you know, again, 15 years ago seemed like just there's no way. Right. There's no way. Uh, you get over into Lakewood and or around White Rock Lake, and you're talking about eight figure. Like there, there's some ten, fifteen million dollar homes that over, yeah. overlook White, or White Rock Lake. On because, the lake. I mean, White Rock Lake is the crown jewel. It's the largest urban lake in in North or in the United States. Yeah. And I mean, hike and bike trails, dog parks. It's a constant, twenty four hours a day. Yep. Somebody's doing something on a White Rock Lake. I can't remember, uh, and I know we're kind of veering away from highs and lows of the area, but uh, the bike trails that are. I mean, it seems like all the trails in DFW hub or connect to White Rock Lake Trail and go from there. So I think, and I heard us that, and I'm probably wrong. So for those of you that bike and don't hit me over the head but there's something like 48 miles of trails that are just here in the area but then that connects to another set of trails that can take you right way uh, out uh, starting in early 2000s they basically tried to connect all of these hike and bike trails to white rock lake because again it's you, there's an, a nine mile loop and an 11 mile loop yeah and um i mean it is 
it is a peloton cruising around the lake yeah. 24 7 and so it just it becomes a, a destination for bikers and runners and things of that nature if you're training for the marathon i mean it all takes place in and around white rock, white rock lake so yeah. and then the other thing just for because if you don't know about it so it's not a lake where you're gonna load your boat up and go drinking and go party on the no. lake and be in bikinis uh, no motorized boats on the lake, except uh, it, it's only so some of the schools do sort they of their row teams, uh -huh. and then there's a few sailboats, but no motorized boats. N nothing that would produce a wake. Right. No swimming. Right. Yeah. yeah no. You uh, there's stories about people swimming across, and they wind up just scratched up from trees that are just and under. Just, just under, under the, the lake. Yeah. yeah. So the l great history with White Rock Lake. So oh, there's yeah. there's amazing things, and we don't have all the time to go into that. Um, so just circling back to, to highs and lows, we kind of talked about that, the high end of East Dallas. So you, you've got your Lakewood. You've got your, um, I, I kind of consider Lake Highlands to be sort of that next step, next tier down. Um, but let's talk about some more budget friendly. So if you wanted to be in the hub of Dallas, but you know, maybe you don't have that big budget, what are some other sort of gold nugget neighborhoods besides Old Lake Highlands? So there's some areas... Um let's call it southeast kind of that when i'm using the clock uh analogy right call it four five or six um there's some neighborhoods where you can find a four hundred thousand dollar house i mean there's an area called uh, claremont yeah. where there are great deals in there right 1800 square feet and you can get in there for 400 i mean again five years ago six years ago yeah. it could have been 250, 250 but yeah. everything's just jumped up in price i mean the, the trick for these neighborhoods is it, it can be block to block it can be street to street claremont there's a dart line that that comes through the neighborhood and so i always tell people i'm like listen you just don't know if that person that's outside your home is looking at your house, casing your house, or they're waiting on the bus. And so if we can avoid those types of things, you know, that's what I'm trying to, that's, again, yeah. that's where the expertise is. I said, you can drive around, and if you see, you know, just car after car parked out in front of the street, that means the, the they need to call the junk lugger because the garage is full of stuff. <laughs> full of and stuff. It yeah. might be a multifamily situation <laughs> if there's bars on the windows. Thing. Those are the types of I'm thinking of. At the end of the day, when I open that door, I'm looking for stuff that you, the, the, the buyer isn't going to be being paying attention to. Yeah. So that if they go, I love it. What did you see? I'm like, all right, well, this is what I saw. Yeah. And I saw this neighbor with the giant pit bull or, you know, whatever. I, you know, it is. No, no issues with pit bulls, but I'm listening for barking dogs, things of that nature. So just going back, uh, walkability, transportation, because there's a lot of great transportation here. So for, you know, younger, younger, younger generation that's, that's moving, uh, they want to be able to just to easily go to places and get around. And, I, and East Dallas is very good for that. Um, just going into what are some more kind of family activity events? What are, what are some of the big events that happen here? Uh, not necessarily Old Lake Highlands, but just East Dallas, sort of big annual events that are fun, family friendly. Well, um, I mean, we, part of Exchange Club of Lake Highlands, produce a, a, an Oktoberfest every year at White Rock, uh, basically North, Flag Bowl Hill, which okay. is basically Flag they're Hill. building they're building an, an entire amphitheater out there. The, the Dallas Symphony plays Fourth of July. There's, you know, you could consider it whether it's a 5K or some actual event. There's something going on in and around the lake once a month at least. And so, again, during the big holidays. Uh, there's in Old Lake Highlands we have Boy Scout Hill which overlooks the lake which overlooks downtown cool. and so you'll see people show up at 2 o'clock on Independence Day because you're going to be able to see no less than four fireworks shows going on at the same time wow I mean, it's, it's and with the the backdrop of the lake very cool it, it's fantastic yeah. um, and go ahead Ed. well I was going to say one of the to that point one of the things that I think makes Old Lake Highlands and Lake Highlands and Lakewood so unique to Dallas is the hills. Oh, yeah. Because Dallas is, let's be honest, flat as a board. Yeah. You fly into Dallas, Texas, and you're coming in, especially into DFW, and you can just see forever. Right. But because of the lake and the rivers that lead to it, this area is very green. It's very lush. I mean, when we first bought our house, people, we had friends over, and they would drive up to the house and go, how did you ever find this yeah. area? <laughs> no. It's people, because most people, when they move to Dallas, they move, you know, they come out of college, they move to Uptown, yeah. they live in the village, something like that. And then, and then they move to Plano or North Dallas or wherever, but this is, like, you have to look for this because we're kind of out of the way. And yeah. it's wonderful. The M Street started with the, you know, the average homes, 1910 to mm -hmm. 1930, mm -hmm. where Old Lake Highlands is more post-war. Post mm -hmm. I live in a house in 45, but most of them are 50, 60. So, 
there's pecans everywhere. The, yeah. squirrels, the squirrels will tell you. They're everywhere. <laughs> and, but we've, there's 75-year-old pecan trees and just huge. hanging out. Huge. And it's, yeah. that's what makes it awesome. The lake's going to host uh, White Rock Marathon this weekend. That's oh. right. Okay. Nice. Which yeah. in Dallas, Dallas is Dallas so... Marathon, no. it, it, which I was saying, Dallas is so interesting because I didn't know this until I moved here. It's like a. It's not just for the runners. It's like a party atmosphere. Oh, yeah. like people what's host the fr- what's big the things phrase in the front of, of East Dallas? I'm not gonna say it. I know the phrase of East Dallas. Um, buy me another beer. No, no all it's close. Kidding. Keep East Dallas. <laughs> oh, funky, funky. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so that's it's right. Riff off the Austin. Yeah. It's yes. a riff off the Austin take. Yes. Like keep Austin weird. Keep East Dallas yeah. funky. So Here's there's the, a, there's a lot of really cool eccentric people here uh, in the yeah. area in the neighborhood for sure. The so only, I just wanted to touch on really fast, like going back to. So you started to talk about the size of house, right? So, uh, you know, you get into the 40s, 50s, you know, they're around that 14 to 1500 square foot. Um, But then you said something about a teardown. And for viewers that don't know what a teardown is, so that's the the older house that somebody's let it maybe go down and the foundation pier and beam is jacked up and they just said, you know what, the house isn't worth fixing, but we can just bulldoze it and they're going to build another house, right? And so the lots are much larger here in East Dallas because they just had big lots back right. then. So, I mean, any of these, as you know, you go to the new subdivisions and they're stacked right on top of each other because the developers figured out, no, I can money. It's like, yeah, it's like yeah. an airplane. They can squeeze in an extra seat. They're going to do it. Um, back then, back in the day, that's not how it was. You're not on top of one another. Um, so the lots here, at least in Old Lake Highlands, are you know 70 wide, 120 to 150 deep, and so. Um, the values in the land. Uh, yeah. And so if there's a house that just, if it's 1,200 square feet and it's going to take $150,000 to get it rehabbed, it's not going to make financial sense for a, a buyer who, a first-time home buyer, um, to come in and, and they just don't have that discretionary income. So typically yeah. what they do is a, um, they call junk luggers and pull everything out and then... Builder comes in, scrapes it, and the, you can expect the rule of thumb, just in general, like when you see new construction, if it's $1.2 million listed brand new, that means they probably bought the lot for about 400000 That yeah. lot, That lot value is usually one-third of what that final product now, is. Now, and they're just a crazy weird story because it, it, it has, ha- I don't know if it's ever happened to you or any of your clients, or maybe this has happened to anybody that you know, but I know that it's happened multiple times where they go to bulldoze one of these houses and they show up with the big heavy equipment and they accidentally bulldoze the wrong house. <laughs> Has that ever happened to any of your clients? Like I know uh, two people that, that, that one of them was home at the time and he stopped them. So it was like, no, 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 you got the wrong house. But the guys just, you know, somebody got a misprint on their work order and they were about to just bulldoze the wrong house. Wow. I haven't heard that show up on Facebook or next door and that's usually where you know, I, I just kind of dip my toe in and make sure everybody's cool yeah. and then I'm like okay everything's cool um, I'm sure it has happened it hasn't yeah. happened in our area again the M streets were the two stories where I heard of that, yeah. that happening and that would which make, is a real common area for houses to get bulldozed right smaller, right, right, right. smaller Tudor style houses and we don't, have a, we don't have a homeowners association or anything like that there's very limited deed restrictions and so that's what makes it attractive for these builders because they can take a small home and then replace it with yep. a 4,000 5,000 square foot home and again yep. because we have the elementary school they go okay we can get our kid through elementary school um, and then and we can look at private school options because there's a ton of private schools yeah. in the area. So let's just uh, kind of wrap up with um, what are some of the things, like if you're showing Old Lake Highlands House and, you know, you, you have inspection, what are you forecasting to your client to say, now this is probably going to pop up, so let's just get ahead of that. So I know what they are, but I just sure want to make sure you know what they are. Yeah, <laughs> you're and, well, telling and, our viewers and, and what and they I are. I mentioned it earlier um, where, again, you have people – take their buyers into East Dallas and Lake Highlands um, because it's a, it's a price point that's attractive. I mean, at the end of the day, they get a 3% cut of if it's a $500,000 house or a million dollar house. That's a lot of money for a realtor. Um, and so you'll have some agents that aren't necessarily familiar with pure and beams come in and they'll walk in the front door and go, oh my gosh, there's a crack on the wall. That must be a foundation <laughs> issue. And then you have to say, well, no, we have, it's a clay-based soil here in North Texas and yep. there's seasonal movement. Yep. And as, as uh, we talked about earlier, there's some topography changes. And so water is going, to, gravity and water yeah, are going to go where like they want to go. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, you're going to have some seasonal movement, doors that latch, doors that won't latch. 
And then we start talking about um, cast iron plumbing. Um, there may be an asbestos pipe here and there. And yeah. again, um, you know, as long as you don't mess with the asbestos pipe, yeah. it's not going to mess with you. But if you want to abate, yeah. uh, have an abatement company come in, you can do that. Again, it is just omnipresent. And so yeah. those are the types of things where you're like, if you're not comfortable with this, there's a suburb down the road that we can yeah. probably find you something else. <laughs> but you, but you already cut that off at the past at the beginning of your conversation when when you talked to them about right off like the what what are you comfortable with? What do you want to work on? Are you a handy person? Are you not a handy person? And so you're having that conversation up front. I know you do. I, I'm not a handy person by any stretch of yeah. the imagination. Again, that's why I'm in real estate because it helps to know people that know people that I can <laughs> hire to come over and do that. I'll spend the money, but right. I'm, you know, me, me it's just staring at a hammer, going, "What do I do with this?" But uh, no, it, it is just, it, again, managing expectations and, have, and explain to them that if, if, if we're under contract and we have it inspected and there's a red flag and I always say, listen, we, you and I we're see these things, we see these things all the time all the and time, it, yeah. it, it just water off a, a, a duck's back. Yeah. The buyer may be sitting there just bug eye going, oh my gosh. What do you mean? Yeah. It's like, well, well no, no, no. If you're no, moving no, no, from no. another, if you're from right. Connecticut where everything's in, you know, right. granite rock and you're right. like maybe asking about Any radon basements. and you're like, we don't have radon and we don't have basements <laughs> right. and, you know, we, we don't need that. But if you're moving here, you know, our soils are terrible. Uh, we've got well, those older houses are going to have those problems and it's yeah. just the fact of life. And, and if I inspected any house in this neighborhood... It's all, all these the all these same problems are going right. to pop and up. And that's that's this. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, this house has these problems. Yeah. Guess what? The house down the street has that problem. Yeah. The house around the corner has that problem. Yeah. The house in the next neighborhood they have that problem. Yeah. And, and it's again and these I, through being in the business for so long you get you know oh this home was built from 1965 to 1975. There's a greater chance, as you know, aluminum wiring's present. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that's a deal killer. Yeah. It just, you have to it's make sure that... It's thing to overcome. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so, and, and on the rarest occasion, we probably see this more in the M streets than anything else, but you will run into some of the old knob and tube wiring where they I still have there. the old school knob and tube, you know, old, the very first original style of wiring. And insurance companies are like, er, nope, not yeah. insuring that house, won't do it. And so then people are like, what do I do? And it's like, well, you know, you got to rewire some things right. here. And, and at the end of the day, if it's, we always say, if it's a, a latent defect or, or something that it's going to scare away buyer A, it's probably going to scare away buyers B, C, and D. And so as a seller, you're having that conversation going, all right, here are the types of things that we're going to forecast that they're going to come at us with. So just be prepared. And it's just about transparency. At the end of the day, you want the buyer to be confident with what the product that you're yeah. selling and the seller you want to be able, once it's done, you don't want to have to field phone calls or you yeah. know, have an attorney reach out to you going, hey, you oh, didn't, yeah, you that's didn't the disclose. Worst. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a, you know, I, and you are as well. And I think all of us have that mentality of it's, it's a, it's a client for life. I want somebody that's, I'm, that's going to call me on their next transaction. As a matter of fact, I want them to tell all their friends and family how smooth and how great the deal went. So um, good things. I just wanted to kind of wrap up with um, sort of how cool this area is. And so there's some of the greatest restaurants, greatest food. Uh, there's really awesome venues. There's just so much around this. It's very well cultured um, in this area where if you went further north, it just it becomes more corporate boxy and you're just getting your, you know, your box type of stuff. Where here in East Dallas and Old Lake Highlands, there's some really cool places. So I don't know if you've got, if you want to name some of your little I mean, favorite place didn't even to go. mention the arboretum which is right yeah. on the lake which is a yeah, fantastic. Right on. And, they, and they now have the new children's center which is part of the arboretum yeah there's a lot of parks there's a lot of sports too there's a uh disc golf course that's rugby. Anyway, yeah, rugby. i was about to say you do yeah. uh um, rugby, rugby right yeah there's a there's a, a couple of rugby teams in the area there's i mean both men and women there's golf courses. There's some. We've got our top golf. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, a little bit children's everything. theater as well. Yep. Like yep, Dallas Children's that's, Theater. That's amazing. Yep. So I mean, the, the the nice thing is most of the restaurants, uh, retail, etc. Mm -hmm. It's all family owned. Mm -hmm. It's not like yeah. big corporate and whatnot. And that's that's why I grew up in the suburbs. And I'm once we moved to East Dallas, it's like, well, no that's offense it. to Chili's, but. I'm done with the baby back ribs. <laughs> yeah. like I can actually go get decent barbecue down here. Yeah. And that's what that's what I love about it. It's yeah. just it's it's, it's one of the only areas, and, and this is a big thing for our viewers out there. It's one of the only areas that I've seen in the Metroplex. Of course, we're in Austin and, and San Antonio as well, but I've never really seen families 
say, okay, well, we're ready to move, but we're only going to move three blocks that way. Oh, yeah. Because they oh, yeah. want to stay here. They yeah. don't, mm -hmm. don't want to move outside. Yeah. So they'll, yeah. they'll move, but they're just kind of maybe upgrading because they had another kid, and they just want that extra bedroom, and they want mm -hmm. that thing. And so real estate within this little bubble is really like a tight-knit group of people. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, it's really important to hook up with that agent right. that knows the area, that has the relationship base with the lender, with junk lugger, with you know plumbers, electricians, roofers, because I mean, they know the area, they know the problems, and they know what's going on. Home inspectors and right. home inspectors. Right. Home inspectors. Yes. I mean, part of <laughs> part of the value added proposition that I bring to the table when I'm working with other um, with buyers is I know the vast majority of the agents that work in the area. So when I put an offer in front of them. They go, hey, hey it's Eric. Eric. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. He's been in the business for a long yeah. time. I've done X, Y, and Z transactions with him yeah. and vice versa. If I'm on the listing side, I go, hey, guys, this is about path of least resistance. Yeah. If I know the, the buyer and the, the, the offers are basically the same. Um, Rule out I, the crazies. I'm going to go, all right, well, this person is <laughs> probably the path of least resistance because mm -hmm. they make deals happen. And that's yeah. uh, none of them. You get paid, but no. He and I don't get paid until we get this across, across that the finish line right. at the at the very end. Well, yeah. we're coming to the end of the show. I just wanted to wrap up. Um, just Eric Holmes, Compass Real Estate, yep. Chase Pinkston, Integrity Mortgage. Like you guys bring so much to the table. And Andrew, you're just such a great good Samaritan, and you. you're you're doing good things for our community and been very involved. So I'm I'm glad you finally made it to Texas. Thank you. Um, so. That's going to wrap up this episode of How to Buy a Home in Old Lake Highlands. So hopefully we've, you've gotten some golden nuggets and gotten educated on some great things that are happening here in Old Lake Highlands. We will be back at another neighborhood somewhere in the Metroplex. Uh, could be Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, or a neighborhood that you're looking for. So Clayton Bailey, How to Buy a Home in. We'll see you next time. Cheers.